delighted to have this opportunity to dive into the scriptures with you, to dive into Jewish traditions, to give you an overview of why Jewish people reject Jesus, Yeshua as Messiah, to look at some of the principal objections our people have bought, brought through the centuries, objections to faith in Yeshua the Messiah based on church history, based on world history, based on the Old Testament, based on the New Testament, based on theology, based on messianic prophecy. We'll cover all those and, and we'll help equip you not just to understand the objections, but to be ready to respond to those objections. So we want you to understand what the issues are and then how to respond to them in an intelligent way. Now, when I came to faith in Yeshua in 1971, I was 16 years old. And to be perfectly honest, if you mentioned the name Yeshua to me, I wouldn't have known who you were talking about. I heard about this Jesus. He was foreign to me though, because I was, I was Jewish and we Jews didn't believe in him. In fact, I remember somewhere before I turned 13 that I heard that Jesus was Jewish. And I was with my friends, we were in Hebrew classes, very, very light Hebrew classes, but Hebrew classes we were taking before we were gonna be bar mitzvahed at the age of 13. And we were standing outside the synagogue. I remember it, so I know it was before I was 13 because it was during those classes. And I said to my Jewish friends, have you ever heard that Jesus is Jewish? And one of them said, no, he's not. And the other said, no, I heard that too. I think I heard that too. We actually had a debate about it. And I thought I was so clever. I came out with this great joke. So when did Jesus become Catholic? After he rose from the dead? See, that's what we understood. He was the head of the Catholic church and foreign to us as Jews. And even if he started as a good Jewish boy, one of my friends, Jewish follower of Yeshua for decades now, when he was growing up, he thought that Jesus was the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ. He had no idea that Christ meant Messiah. He didn't know the background of this. And to this day, many Jews don't know that. Even within Israel, if you say Yeshua, most Israelis don't know who you're talking about. They know Jesus as Yeshu, which to the religious Jewish mind is, a, is an acronym. It's an actual curse against him. But they, they, and still they don't associate him with being the Jewish Messiah. So there's, there's a lot of ground to be covered, a lot of obstacles to be overcome. But when I came to faith, at that time I was a heavy drug user. I was shooting heroin. I had long hair. I was playing drums in a rock band. Uh, my wife, Nancy, who's also a Jewish follower of Yeshua, was an atheist when we met at the age of 19. And then God brought her to himself and saved her. And she saw a picture of me back in my hippie days with the long hair and she started laughing. I said, now you're laughing because I, I look like a woman. She said, no, I'm laughing because you look like an ugly woman. And that was me, long haired hippie, rock drummer, heavy drug user. I went to a little gospel preaching church to pull my, friend's best, uh, my best friends out of that church. I heard the good news about Jesus. God convicted me of my sin. I was transformed. My dad was thrilled to see me off drugs. And to be perfectly honest with you, Jewishness was not an issue to me right then. The big issue was pride, to admit that I was wrong and my lifestyle was sinful. The, the next issue was, was drugs. I loved drugs. I loved the lifestyle I was living. I didn't want to give that up. And then down the list was the fact that I was Jewish and Jews don't believe this. Well, my dad, being a Jewish man, mildly religious, go to synagogue sometimes on a regular basis. He, he was glad to see me off drugs, but he said, look, we don't believe these things, we're Jews. You need to talk to the rabbi. And bear in mind, whatever Hebrew I had learned a few years ago, I had forgotten. If you gave me a Hebrew Bible, I, I guess I could have known that we started the right, and read from right to left, I knew that, but could I have read it, translated it? No. If you talk to me about details of Jewish tradition and why do we do this or that, I couldn't tell you why. The little Jewish education I had was minimal. So now I meet the local rabbi. Nice guy, very well educated. And he begins to say, look, this is completely contrary to what the Hebrew says and your English, tra your English translations, they're terrible. And, and he's a very nice guy. And, and I said, look, I'll, I'll, I'll use a dictionary in the back of Strong's Concordance, this well-known concordance that we especially used back then. I'll use the dictionary in the back of that in, in the meantime. I remember he said to me, meantime, shmeantime, if you don't know Hebrew, it doesn't mean anything. And then he brings me to meet other rabbis. Now here's the deal. The Judaism I grew up in was, was so-called conservative Judaism, but really very liberal 
in many ways, very wishy-washy. Uh, on an average Saturday, there'd be maybe 10 men at the shul, at the synagogue. Sometimes my dad would get an emergency phone call, Abe, can you get to the synagogue? We don't have enough men for minion. We don't even have 10 men here for prayer service. And yet at the high holidays, we had to build an extra annex to pack in the hundreds and hundreds of people that wanted to come for the high holidays. It was hypocritical religion, just, there's, just like there's superficial, superficial, hypocritical Christian religion. That's what I grew up with in Judaism. I thought that was what Judaism was about. So now my rabbi brings me to meet these ultra-Orthodox rabbis in Brooklyn. At this point, I was saved almost two years. I had read the King James Bible through cover to cover about five times. I used to memorize 20 verses out of the King James Bible every day. I had done that for over six months. I had memorized more than 4,000 verses. I don't care who I talked to, I would bowl them over. Now this rabbi brings me to meet ultra-Orthodox rabbis in Brooklyn, New York. Black beards, black coats, study and pray day and night, very nice men. And, and I begin to quote all my scriptures to them, use all my arguments, throw this all out to them, and they very politely said, you're wet behind the ears. They, they said, look, these, you can't use these English translations, they have so many errors. They said, do you remember any Hebrew? It's like, no. Oh. Not much. They said, look, we're not going to lie to you. And they, they start to show me letter by letter what the Hebrew says, comparing it to the English. I felt like a little child. And I thought, okay, okay. These men are very sincere. They pray for hours like I do. They study for hours like I do. They're just as devoted to their faith as I am to mine. They're telling me what I'm doing is not authentically Jewish. I looked in their synagogue and there are the men with the prayer shawls over their head and praying and the long beards. And I thought, oh, look. Looks more Jewish than my church does, for sure. Now they're challenging me to the core, very gently, very nicely. And I said, I know the experience I had in God is real. I know that. But I have to have answers for their questions. If I'm following the truth, then the truth can withstand objections and scrutiny. And when I started college, I started taking Hebrew classes, modern Hebrew, because they didn't have ancient. So I, I got a grammar, I taught myself biblical Hebrew, and then I ended up getting a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Literatures from New York University, majored in Hebrew in college, then went on to a PhD. The reason was, I wanted to be able to study the Hebrew scriptures in Hebrew for myself. I wanted to be able to put this in the context of the, the world in which these scriptures were given and understand. I wanted to be able to read the rabbinic commentaries and the rabbinic objections in the original languages and see what they had to say and sort it out for myself. And I was determined. I remember one season of deep, deep spiritual seeking, deep spiritual seeking on my face before God after hours of dialogue with these rabbis in Brooklyn. I said, God, if being an authentic Jew and honoring you as God and being faithful to you as God means that I have to renounce Jesus and, and, and leave everything and leave my friends and be, and be a, a, a mockery in their sight of denying the faith. If I have to do that to be true to you, I will do it. I said, conversely, if what I believe about Jesus is true, if he really is the Messiah and, and what I believe is true and to be an authentic Jew, I need to follow him and follow the scriptures that speak of him. I don't care what the Jewish community says about me. I'm going to do it. And it was in one of those intense times of praying and seeking that once again, overwhelmingly, God's word confirmed to me, Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel. So I want to encourage you, you don't have to be afraid of any objection. You don't have to be afraid of any rabbi, any counter missionary, any internet site, any book. There are solid answers for every objection. And I'm convinced if any Jewish person will seek God earnestly and ask who in fact is this Yeshua? And what do the scriptures say about him? If they will seek him earnestly and have the courage to follow God wherever the truth leads, they will join us as fellow believers of Jesus Yeshua, the Messiah. Now, before I give you an overview of the six main categories of objections, the way I've divided them up, and how we respond in an overview sense to each of these, I want to just lay out two very simple principles. Two simple principles. Number one, if we are going to do solid apologetics, 1 Peter 3.15, having an answer for those who ask us, having a defense of the faith, the Greek apologia, 
if we're going to do solid apologetics, the first thing we need to do is understand the objections that are coming our way. In other words, many times we pass each other like ships in the night. Many times it appears to me as if we don't understand the objection and the person objecting doesn't understand our answer. We just pass each other. So how do you know if you are adequately understanding the objection? It's very simple. You restate it to the person in their own words. Are you saying this? Is your problem this? Is your issue this? And repeat it back in your own words. If you'll do that, and they say, yes, that's my point, then first obstacle overcome. You understand the objection. But now here's the second one, and it's very costly. To adequately understand stand an objection and answer it adequately, you must feel the weight of it. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say you get a call one day and it's your best friend and he's hysterical, crying on the phone. He's hysterical. His wife and kids have just been killed in a car wreck and he's just given, been given the news. He's hysterical, he's shocked, he's a believer but he's hysterical and shocked, you're the first one that he calls. Will you say, praise the Lord, Romans 8, 28, all things work out together for the good, it's gonna be all right. Of course not, because he's in agony right now. And he needs someone just to weep with him and put an arm around him and comfort him. And at a certain point, come around to Romans 8, 28, but, but that's a little down the road. Well, the same way, when we do not adequately feel the weight of an objection, we give a superficial answer. So when we don't adequately feel the weight of, of church history through Jewish eyes, when we don't adequately feel how the, the Holocaust shapes Jewish thinking about Yeshua, when we don't adequately understand the depth of the objection to the apparent messianic prophecy or the depth of the theological objection, then we are answering a deep objection with a superficial answer and it won't satisfy. You see, the goal is not just to keep our own sanity. The goal is not just to help us understandably, but to be able to reach out to Jewish people. Now, I'll, I'll be candid. My first reason for writing five volumes on answering Jewish objections to Jesus was to help my fellow Jewish believers because I was so assaulted with objections and, and obstacles and issues when I came to the faith and in the early years of just talking to rabbi after rabbi after rabbi, and then everyone I studied with in college and grad school didn't believe what I believed. I never studied with someone who believed what I believed. They were either secular, some were religious and hostile to what I believed. So I, I had to deal with this constantly. I wanted to be able to help those who get picked off. Because you know what happens, you're not even a religious Jew, but as soon as you come to faith in Yeshua, your family wants to talk to you, wants you to talk to the rabbi. Or they've gone to a counter missionary website and they say, what about this and this and this and this and this? So my first reason for writing these volumes was to help my fellow Jews grow in the faith, fellow Jewish believers. But then, of course, I want to reach my Jewish people with these truths and help them overcome these objections, which means we have to feel the weight of them. I say it's painful and costly because you have to put yourself in the shoes of those who differ. You have to step back and see the world through their eyes. You, you have to see how the objections appear, see how it seems that the New Testament fabricated things to make it look like Yeshua was the Messiah, see how it appears that they wrench things out of context, see the effects of the Crusades and the Inquisitions and all of this on our people over the centuries. Then we can give adequate responses. Now, the five volumes that I've written on answering Jewish objections to Yeshua go into great depth, and in this class, we will be giving a survey and overview the meat, the heart of the objections, and the meat and the heart of the answers. But as we do that, I want you to have a sense of where we're going, give you the entire overview, and, and lay out, just in principle, the different objections. So, this is how we've laid it out. Those who have access to the books, I lay this out in the beginning of each of the five volumes. I break the objections down into six different categories. Number one, general objections. Number two, historical objections. Number three, theological objections. Number four, messianic prophecy objections. Number five, objections based on the New Testament. Number six, objections based on traditional Judaism. So, General objections, what do I mean by this? Well, these are the most common, 
the, the least sophisticated, often the most emotional. They contain broad generalizations, they make sweeping statements, and they're based on the perception of what Jews, quote, as a whole, believe and do. The heart of these objections is simply this. Jesus is not for Jews. Our religion is Judaism, not Christianity. No true Jew would ever believe in Jesus. General objections. To a great extent, answering these objections is a matter of correcting misconceptions, as well as getting people to stop and think about the emotional and sometimes irrational nature of what they're saying. Now, historical objections, that's more difficult. Historical objections fall into two primary categories. First category is Yeshua can't be the Messiah because there's not peace on earth. Well, if, if anybody knows anything about the Messiah, the first thing you know is that he's going to bring about a reign of, of peace on the earth. No more war, beat their swords into plowshares, no, not do any harm on my holy mountain, says the Lord. All these prophecies, Messiah will bring this about. Well, he hasn't. The world is in worse shape now. There have been more wars, more bloodshed, famines, death, horrible tragedies, more since he came than before he came. How can he be the Messiah? That's one part of the historical objection. The other part of the historical objection is the idea that, that the followers of Jesus, Christians, the church, have, have been the cause of Jewish suffering through the centuries from the demonization of the Jews beginning in the second century by so-called church leaders to the, the outright hostile theology about Jews in the fourth century to violent acts like crusades and inquisitions once we get into, oh, about the 1100s thereabouts. And, and then even a direct connection in the eyes of many Jews between the Holocaust and Christianity. If there's one religion we know is not the Messianic religion, it's Christianity. So how do we overcome those historical objections? The first thing we need to do is to identify the mission of the Messiah. The mission of the Messiah was not first and foremost to come and bring peace on the earth. That's the second part of his mission. We need to show that what most Jews think is the first act is actually the second act. That first he came as a priestly king to deal with sin and make atonement for the world and then for the knowledge of Messiah to spread through the world, including the Gentile world, before he will return and finish what he started, and then demonstrate that he's the only one who can return and finish what he started and bring the mission to completion, because he had to set certain things in motion and begin his messianic mission before the second temple was destroyed. We can demonstrate that from scripture, which means he's the only possible messianic candidate. And we also look at church history and recognize the evil, horrific things that have been done by professing Christians. But what we see is that they're in complete violation of what Yeshua taught. We see that today the greatest friends Israel has in the world are Bible-believing Christians. We, we see that throughout history, the gospel of Jesus Yeshua has actually had a positive transforming effect on society. And it's through hypocrisy and departing from the Jewish roots of the faith that the church has committed these atrocities. Uh, theological objections in certain ways are the most serious. Uh, they cut to the heart of the, the differences between, quote, Judaism and Christianity. The reason I say, quote, Judaism and Christianity is, is because the, the difference between them can be exaggerated. And, and we forget that all of the first, quote, Christians were Jews and that the faith in Jesus Yeshua was just another expression of Judaism in the first century. But for the purposes of making the point, we'll say there's a vast distinction between Jewish beliefs and Christian beliefs, between Judaism and Christianity. And what do these differences come down to? Well, the, the nature of God, Trinity, Jesus, Yeshua being God, the Holy Spirit being God, it's a separate person. The continuity of the law. Does the law continue until this day? Was it abolished? Did Paul make an end of it? Did Yeshua make an end of it? Uh, the, the, the nature of mankind, are we all fallen sinners? The need for salvation and the means of atonement. Is there atonement outside of a blood? Do we need the blood of a man? Issues that your average Christian could say, these are foundations to what I believe. Your average Jew would say, well, we reject all this. We reject these. 
So how do we sort that out? What we do is we go back to the Hebrew Scriptures. We go back to the Hebrew Bible and we see that God in His nature is actually complex in His unity. And, and that the New Testament description of Father, Son, Holy Spirit is fully in keeping with what the Hebrew Scriptures teach. We even see some of this illustrated in Jewish tradition as well. And then we see actually that it is the New Testament rather than later rabbinic tradition which rightly continues the trajectory of what the Hebrew Scriptures were teaching on these various subjects. And then we also separate later Christian beliefs from what the Scriptures actually teach. Uh, objections based on Messianic prophecy follow several different lines. We're either told that the verses that we use as Messianic prophecies are actually not really Messianic prophecies, or we are taking them out of context, or we are reinterpreting them in an impossible way, or they are mistranslated in the New Testament, or the events of the New Testament were rewritten to make it look as if prophecies were fulfilled. We'll also be told that Yeshua did not fill any, fulfill any of the provable messianic prophecies, by which is meant bringing world peace or bringing the nations into the knowledge of God or all the Jewish people into the knowledge of God or, or various things like that. What we'd say is actually there are many provable prophecies that he fulfilled, and if he's not the Messiah, there never will be a Messiah. We'll see that many of the verses that are alleged to be not messianic actually are messianic when rightly understood we will see that the New Testament writers can be trusted in their historical accounts. And we'll also see that many times what appears to be a misinterpretation is actually just a Jewish interpretation that was common in the first century. And that when we rightly understand principles of Messianic prophecy, we will see, in fact, that Yeshua is not just a possible Messianic candidate, but the only Messianic candidate. The next set of objections we deal with have to do with objections to the New Testament. Not just the issue of quoting prophecies or quoting the Hebrew Scriptures accurately. We'll be told it's an unreliable book as a whole. It's unreliable in terms of its overall accounts. It, it contradicts itself and, and the genealogies about the birth of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, are mutually contradictory between Matthew and Luke. There's no way to reconcile them, on and on. And in other words, nobody with a working brain, no serious scholar, no serious Jewish student of the Word could possibly believe in the New Testament. Uh, to counter these objections, we compare similar problems with their solutions from the Hebrew Scriptures. In other words, well, what do you do with apparent contradictions in the Hebrew Scriptures? Use that same methodology for the New Testament and you'll come up with the same answers. Uh, we show the Jewishness of the thought patterns and ideas of the New Testament. Many times what seems foreign to us is actually very, very uh, understandable from a first century Jewish mindset. And then we look at apparent contradictions and, uh, and distortions and, and we set the record straight on those. Then lastly, objections based on traditional Judaism, which fall into two categories. One, Judaism is a wonderful, fulfilling, and self-sufficient religion. There is no need to look elsewhere. Two, God gave us a written and an unwritten tradition. We interpret everything by means of that oral tradition without which the Bible makes no sense. So how do we respond to that? Number one, we, we show that there is no such thing as an unwritten oral tradition binding, going all the way back to Moses. We show that everything must flow directly out of what is written in the Hebrew Scriptures in terms of divine authority. And we show as beautiful and rich as Judaism has been for the Jewish people through the centuries that Messiah actually brings a better way. Now, when we resume in our next session, what we'll do is, is start going through the general objections one by one and say, here's the objection so you can get the feel and heart of it. And then here's the way we respond based on reason, based on history, based on scripture, based on tradition, based on culture. And whatever we do, if we do it in the life and power of the Spirit, we will see many Jewish people come to faith in Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah. 
our offer on this program, the best of Dr. Brown's Jewish debates. Join Dr. Michael Brown in three of his best debates and travel along on the journey of discovery as truth is laid out in these powerful DVDs. Watch as Messianic Jewish scholar Dr. Michael Brown, Orthodox Rabbi Shmuley Boteok, and Rabbi Michael Gold argue for two very different interpretations of Scripture in these fast-moving debates. These presentations will provide you with information that will help you answer the questions, Is Jesus the Promised Messiah or not? Is Jesus kosher? And did Jesus really die for our sins? For your tax-deductible gift of $40 or more, Michael would like to send you these three DVD presentations, Did Jesus Die for Our Sins? Jesus, Messiah or Not? And Kosher Jesus? Build your faith and learn how to effectively witness to the Jewish people as you learn about the hard questions surrounding the identity of the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 and much more. These presentations will be a treasure to you and your family for years to come. Also, please visit our website or call and ask how you can receive access to our countless free resources, learn exciting information on what is happening around the world and with our ministry today. When you visit our website, be sure to check out our bookstore for the latest videos, books, and more. You may want to join us during an upcoming radio broadcast. Please contact us today for more information. Please remember, this ministry depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Answering Your Toughest Questions. Maybe you're a Jewish person watching the broadcast. Can I invite you to check out who Jesus Yeshua really is? Find out why I gave my life to him over 40 years ago, why I believe and I'm sure that he is our Messiah. Visit my website, askdrbrown.org. We've got hundreds of hours of free resources. Check out the videos, the audios, the articles. And if you've got questions, contact us. We'd love to help you grow in your faith and discover who Jesus Yeshua is. And maybe you're already a committed follower of Jesus, a Jew or Gentile, and you love Jesus. I want to encourage you to tune in every single week. Join us on this journey and you will learn how you can better share your faith with the Jewish people and introduce them to their Messiah, our Messiah. And everyone visit the website, askdrbrown.org. Plunge into all the resources there and join me for our next week's episode. This has been a paid program made possible by financial contributions to Ask Dr. Brown Ministries from viewers like you in your area. Thank you for your support.